Welcome to Game Theory. My name is Matt Rosu. These presentations are designed to have two purposes. One, for the students taking the class. These are required. These are going to supplement the activities that we're doing in class and are really essential to learn. Second goal, you don't really need to have the in-class part to get some overview or idea of game theory. To get the full foundations, you're going to need a little bit more than what I go through, right? We talk about the book within class, right? We reinforce by going through a lot of problems. But for some good overall insight of game theory, this should be very helpful. This is the first lesson. And we're covering probabilities and game theory in this lesson. So this is very much an overview lesson designed to go through some of the background that we would need to do everything we'll need to do within the course. So if the idea of game theory sounds exciting to you, if you'd like to follow along as we drop these new videos, you know, weekly, sometimes even twice a week, please like and subscribe. Click the notifications bell. You'll receive notification when the next video is released. So without further ado, Probability, everybody's favorite topic, of course. So what's meant by probability? It's numerical measure of the likelihood of one of the possible outcomes of an event. So what's the probability you will win the lottery? Well, if you don't buy a ticket, the probability is zero, right? If you buy a ticket, there's a different probability, incredibly low. But there is some chance that you could win the lottery. Uh, I say incredibly low, I'm thinking like Powerball. I mean, there's some scratch-offs that aren't that low of a chance of winning, even if they are a pretty bad gamble from an expected value point of view. So probabilities could be expressed as a number between 0 and 1, or they can be expressed as a percentage. And within the class, books are going to use different methods. You, you just got to realize that in real life, that's what's going to happen. Sometimes people will just mention a number that you'll win 0.01%, you know, that you'll win 0.01 um, of the time. Okay, 0.01, it's the same as saying 1%. So you just got to be a little bit familiar with this. If the probability is 0.04, it's the same as saying 4%, what would the probability of winning? you know, Powerball be with a ticket, it's 0, 0.000 whatever, however many zeros it is, it's incredibly long. Uh, Percentage-wise, you know, shifted over a couple digits, still incredibly, you know, the same actual probability of winning, just expressed a little bit differently. So I put in an example. If you are rolling a die, um, you know, it could be one, two, three, four, five, or six the probability that you're going to get a roll um, of a one or a two. It's one, one out of three, one third. So it could be 0 0.33 or 33%. So probability, let's have you go through a couple thought exercises. Number one, what's the probability of drawing one spade when pulling one card from a deck of 52 cards? Two, how about drawing two spades if you're doing two pulls? So you're doing two pulls, you've got to draw the spade each time. Three, a little bit trickier, and this is one that I'm not going to go through. I'm going to let you just think about this and try to figure it out. What's the probability of drawing at least one spade if you pull two cards from a deck of 52 cards? A key thing to note, if you play cards at all, uh, you would know this, but just in case, 13 of the 52 cards in a deck are spades. Right, there's four suits, each of them represent one-fourth of the total cards. So the first question I asked, what's the probability of drawing one spade if you're pulling one card from a deck of 52 cards? We've got the ace of spades on the screen. It doesn't have to be the ace. It could be any of the spades. Because there are 13 spades, 52 total cards, just take 30, uh, the 13 divided by 52. It's so probability is 25% or one in four. That's the odds that you will pull a spade if you're drawing one card from a deck of 52. Okay, we're going to get a little trickier though. 
what happens if you're drawing two spades when you're pulling exactly two cards from a deck of 52 cards. Okay, we've got two events and they both need a very specific outcome, right? You're, you're doing two things, you're pulling a card and then you're pulling a card again. You have to have both of them be a spade in order to have this event happen. So, you multiply the probability of the first event happening by the probability of the second event happening and that will get you the probability of drawing two spades. We already figured out the probability of drawing one spade on the first card and that's one in four. So we could just use that. Once you pull that first card, there are 51 cards remaining. Of those 51 cards remaining, 12 of them are spades. So the probability of getting a spade in the second card is 12 divided by 51. Okay, 13 divided by 52 multiplied by 12 divided by 51 is going to get us our probability of pulling two spades from two draws a uh, little under 6%. 0.058 is the calculation for this. So a little bit trickier, but it will be important to understand how to calculate some of these various probabilities. The one that I will not be going through in this video, give you a chance to think about it, those in class, we will go through this in class. Uh, what's the probability of drawing at least one spade when pulling two cards from a deck of 52 cards? It's a little bit trickier. There's a couple ways you could come up with the right answer for this. So for those in class, go ahead and try to figure it out. Uh, want to see want to see your attempt at this in class. So an uncertain event could have several different outcomes and there could be a, you know, each outcome often could have a different numerical value. So you could imagine the ace of spades drawing, like if you draw an ace of spades, we know the probability is one in four, but what happens if you have a bet with somebody and say, okay, they'll win, um, if you draw an ace of spades, you win $5 if you pull it, but if you don't draw the ace of spades, you owe $2, right? You could calculate what the expected value is of this. And expected values are incredibly important. I mean, I'm giving one in terms of gambling, right? Any doing a game of chance really needs to know this but I think it's stunningly useful anyway in terms of thinking through what you should be doing with particular actions right if you're studying for an exam you don't really know beforehand how the hours of studying that you put in might correlate to the grade that you'll receive right that's not that's not known but you could have an idea if you put in a little bit more here you might have a if you put in a significant amount of time maybe you think there's a 50 percent chance of an a a 25 percent chance of an a minus a 15 percent chance of a b plus and a 10 percent chance that it really goes wrong and it's less than that or something like that right but having an idea can be pretty helpful and can help guide you to what you should be doing in the face of the fact that the outcome will be uncertain. And that's going to happen on a lot of things, right? You're applying for jobs. Um, what's the likelihood that you will get a job offer that is one that you'd want? Well, it's going to vary based on how much effort you put in, how many places you apply to, right? I mean, some people put in a first application and it's just going to magically work out. It's not the case for most people. Uh, there could be an expected value of if you put in time and effort and applications, how many responses might you get? Um, really valuable to know that. So that's expected value. It's the weighted average of each outcome. Probabilities are weights. So all you do for expected value, you take a probability an event will occur, multiply it by the value of the outcome. And from there, you get an expected value. This is mathematically how expected value is given, right? Um, P is the probability of the jth outcome occurring, and V is just the value of it. And so you would do this for every single possible iteration, coming up with an expected value. Let's go through a simple example. Sometimes I think the math gets a little trickier, you know, if you're seeing it in the abstract. 
Uh, what's the expected value if you roll a die um, of the roll of a die? Somebody's going to give you $12 if you roll a 1, $18 if you roll a 2, nothing if you roll a 3, 4, 5, or 6. Okay, before I put it on the screen, let's just talk through it, right? Um, each of these options for rolling on the die is 1 and 6, so there's a $12 times 1 sixth, that's 1, plus $18 times 1 sixth, that's the second possible outcome, plus 0 times 1 sixth, and you need to do that four times because you could get a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6, and that ends up to an expected value of $5. You'll notice in this equation, you could put out 1 sixth times 0, plus 1 sixth times 0, plus 1 sixth times 0, plus 1 sixth times 0, four times. Of course, that is the same as 4 sixth times 0. Expected value here, 1 divided by 6 times 12, that's $2. 1 divided by 6 times 18 is $3. That's the expected value if you roll a die, and these are the dollar amounts you get for rolling 1, 2, or 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, let's go through another exercise. Suppose you have a gamble. That'll pay $25 fourth of the time, $10 an eighth of the time, $15 half the time. I'm sorry. It will cost you $15 half the time, and it'll cost you $30 an eighth of the time. I would like you, you know, if you're taking this, taking it seriously, why don't you pause the video, pull out a pen and paper, or go into Excel, and calculate the expected value of this gamble. Go ahead and click pause now. Resume when you want the answer. Okay, calculating this out, um, right, 25 times 1 fourth plus 10 times 1 eighth minus 15 times 1 half minus 30 times 1 eighth ends up being negative 30 over 8. Got to put this in dollar terms. The expected value of this gamble is negative $3.75. So expected value looks at pure monetary expected outcomes. That's not always the best way to think about what's the right decision for humans to make, and that's because of risk aversion. So the expected value, it shows us a fair gamble price, essentially, right? Um, that previous gamble we showed, if somebody wanted to take you to take that, the fair price, they should be paying you $3.75 for you to take that particular gamble. That's what expected value shows us, the fair value. But there's plenty of cases where people are very rational to not take you know, to have a preference outside of the fair value. And let's look at fire insurance, right? Suppose you own a home, $200,000 home, and there is a one in 20,000 chance that your house would be just completely destroyed by a fire. You lose all $200,000 worth of your home. What is the expected loss from a fire? Well, it's the $200,000 value of the home. There's a one in 20,000 chance that it'll happen, so it's $10. Is it irrational though for a person to spend $15 per year or $20 per year on fire insurance? Absolutely not. Not what not one bit, right? Because you know, 10 or 15 bucks or 20 bucks or 30 bucks a year for somebody um, that's not really life-changing whatsoever. But should this devastating event happen, this is completely life-altering. So it, because people are risk averse, it makes sense to essentially take a bad gamble to avoid a very, very bad, uncertain outcome. So the person is who does this, they're certainly not irrational. We would say they are risk averse, and that's preferring a safe payment. You know, hey, I'll, I'm happy to lose 20 bucks every year to make sure I don't lose, completely lose my house. So a person who chooses the safe payment over a risky payment that has a greater expected value is said to be risk averse. There is also the idea of risk neutral. Risk neutral, that is just you're happy with the expected value. That's what you do. Uh, risk loving, you actually like the gamble. Um, you'd prefer to take the gamble rather than the safe outcome, all else equal. Risk aversion plays into expected utility because utility is measured by economists. It's the subjective benefits an individual derives from a particular good, service, income, or payoff. 
And with income, the utility from a level of income, as you make more money, people generally are happier with more money. But there is what we call diminishing marginal utility. So the, the idea on diminishing marginal utility, the first amount of money that somebody receives is more valuable to them as a person than the second amount. That's an equivalent amount. So for example, uh, let's say you had $100,000 income, right? Like that first $100,000 income is pretty meaningful for somebody, right? I mean, if you're going from zero to 100,000, okay, you go from nothing to having a pretty good income. You can live, you can be in a nice place, you could have a vehicle if you want a vehicle, uh, you can go out to eat sometimes, you can go on vacations, right? I mean, going from zero to $100,000 is truly life-changing. What about going from $100,000 income to $200,000 income? Which is, I mean, way, way, way above national average, of course. Um, well, that next $100,000 income, surely it's got a lot of value. Of course it does. Um, however, is it as important to a person as going from zero to 100,000? No, not at all. Um, and I mean, you could do this on a much smaller scale by saying, hey, you're hungry. How, how valuable is that first piece of pizza? Pretty valuable. What about the second piece? Maybe you still like it. What about the third piece? Okay, fourth piece, at some point you don't even want it anymore because there's this diminishing marginal utility. And be expected utility plays in a little bit to risk aversion, right? Because the idea of losing 15 or 20 bucks in a year, not a big deal, whereas it'd be a devastating loss to just lose out on a house. And you know, for those who are the students and haven't paid insurance yet, by the way, you're gonna pay far more than 20 bucks a year on your you know, home insurance. But, um, you know, simple example, simple numbers to go with on that. So um, in game theory, generally, we're going to assume risk neutrality just because it makes things easier. And it's not really going to change any of the outcomes. But, but be cognizant of the idea that expected utility does matter. And there are ways that this could factor in. So just want to make sure that's in your mind as you're thinking through things. Final note before I end this video, right, many times throughout the course, and the course could be for those who are in the course at Susquehanna or for those who are just watching along video to video, uh, players will not know with certainty the outcomes of the game. They're going to be weighing probabilities. you got to understand this stuff. So hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, this is the start of a series of videos on the game theory course. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you tune into the next one. We'll see you in the next video.